Hello everyone, welcome to Study IQ. In this lesson, we'll discuss all the last one year current affairs of science and technology. This is part three of science and technology current affairs series. This will be immensely beneficial for all the aspirants of UPSC prelims 2017. I am Bhumika Saini. I've done my engineering from NIT Jaipur. Study IQ has launched various pen drive courses like course for SSC examination, for bank examination, for other government examination and for UPSC the pen drive course will be launched very soon on 1st June 2017. So the whole science and technology current affairs has been bifurcated into various sections. In the part 1 we have discussed all the current issues of defense technology. In the part 2 we have discussed all the current issues of space technology. In the part 3 we will discuss all the current issues of health as well as biotechnology. In the upcoming lessons we will discuss about issues related to nuclear technology and uh, a separate miscellaneous section we will discuss uh, in the upcoming sections. So let's start with health and biotechnology. Uh, in this lesson, I'm first covering health, all the issues related to health in last one year, and then I'll move to biotechnology. So in health, we, we are starting with vaccines, the whole concept of vaccine and, and what all was related, uh, what all was there in news related to vaccines. So first of all, this is universal immunization program. Now this is very important. From prelims aspect, they can ask you questions related to what all diseases are protected by vaccination under UIP or the vaccines that are present under UIP. So the diseases protected by vaccination under UIP, that is universal immunization program includes diphtheria, pertussis, tetanus, polio, tuberculosis, measles, hepatitis, be Japanese encephalitis this is commonly known as brain fever meningitis and pneumonia caused by hemophilus influenza type B now the vaccines to prevent these uh, uh, diseases are uh, bacillus calmid gurine uh, DPT that is diphtheria pertussis tetanus toxoid oral polio vaccine measles hepatitis B tetanus toxoid Japanese vaccination in selected high disease burden districts so this is mainly prevalent in the eastern part of India like especially in the Odisha and the surrounding regions then hemophilus influenza type B containing pentavalent vaccine that is for DPT hepatitis B plus for hemophilus influenza type B so this is in selected states now this was in news because uh, Union Ministry of Health and Family Affair uh, fa uh, sorry Health and Family Welfare it has rolled out measles rubella vaccine under uh, universal immunization program so that's why it was in news in february that a new vaccine has been introduced earlier it was measles now instead of measles there will be measles rubella combined vaccine so that will cater to protection for measles as well as rubella in addition pneumococcal uh, pneumococcal conjugate vaccine that is for protection of pneumococcal pneumonia is also becoming a part of this uip basket in three other states from march 2017 so as such this was in news in march and february 2017 because new vaccines have been added in this now uip basket already has measles that we have discussed that it already has measles once mr vaccine is introduced the present monovalent measles vaccine will be discontinued so once the measles rubella vaccine has been introduced then the measles the monovalent measles vaccine will be discontinued so this is very important that is what all vaccines are covered under uip and what all vaccines are newly introduced under uip basket now let's discuss the national schedule for vaccination like uh, bacillus calmid gurine this is a vaccine for protection of tuberculosis so this you should remember this can come in in the match the following format as well so bacillus calmid gurine it is for protection of tuberculosis the number of doses that are to be administered is one then it is given at birth up to one year if not given earlier then oral polio vaccine it is a liquid vaccine it is for the protection of poliomyelitis and uh, the number of doses are five uh, birth dose for institutional deliveries there are primary three doses at sixth week 10th week and 14th week and one booster dose at 16 to 24 month of age and this is given orally then uh, hepatitis b this is a liquid vaccine this is for protection of hepatitis b number of doses here are four and birth dose uh, one is birth dose within 24 hours of the birth for institutional deliveries then primary three doses at sixth 10th and 14th week so there are four one at the birth then at 6th 10th and 14th week then dpt that is for protection of diphtheria pertussis and tetanus there are total five doses in this these doses at 6 10 and 14 week and three doses at 6 10th and 14th week and two booster dose at 16 to 24 month of age and then later at five to seven years of age sorry five to six years of age then measles 
this is measles vaccine for protection against measles then the number of vaccines are two number of doses for the vaccine are two and one is administered at 9 to 12 months of age so and second dose is given at 16 to 24 uh, months of age then there is tetanus toxoid this is for protection against tetanus and here two doses are given one uh, at uh, 10 years of age and the other one at 16 years of age but for pregnant women the case is different for pregnant women two doses will be given one dose if previously vaccinated within 3 years so for pregnant women as such there has to be two two doses but uh, uh, it will be one if uh, the women is previously vaccinate, vaccinated within 3 years then uh, japanese encephalitis uh, this is uh, given in selected high disease burden district this we've already discussed that uh, especially in the eastern part of india this uh, this is for protection of japanese encephalitis and this is also known as brain fever here two doses are given one is at the uh, at the age of 9 to 12 months and second at the age of 16 to 24 months then there is human influenza type b uh, vaccine that is this, this is a pentavalent vaccine it contains uh, human influenza type b dpt plus hepatitis b and uh, this is for protection against human influenza type b pneumonia plus hiv meningitis and here the doses that are to be given are three one at 6th week then 10th week and 14th week of age so this is very important one you should understand which vaccine is for is given for uh, uh, protection from which disease and the number of doses when they are given so vaccination schedule okay now let's discuss other news related to vaccine like uh, polio uh, one thing which you which you should uh, clearly follow for prelims uh, examination is you should remember the disease and the disease is is a, a viral disease or a bacterial disease right and how it is transmitted what are the main uh, like and if there is any mosquito if it is a vector borne disease whether it is air borne disease water borne disease so these thing you should uh, uh, keep in mind and uh, uh, we'll discuss all the disease that were in news in last one year so polio is a highly infectious viral disease which mainly affects young children so it is affecting young children plus it is a viral disease it is transmitted by person to person and it spread mainly through fecal oral route so remember it is transmitting through fecal oral route or it can be transmitted less frequently by a common vehicle that is contaminated water or food and what happens then it multiplies in the intestine and the, uh, that's uh, that's how it invades the nervous system and it causes paralysis so that is the main problem in polio that it causes paralysis now there are two vaccine in polio one is opv that is oral polio oral polio vaccine and the other one is ipv that is injectable inactivated polio vaccine so this was a news because um, India has become the first country globally to introduce fractional dose of IPV in childhood immunization program in eight states and union territories in 2016. So let's discuss about IPV. Now IPV is produced from wild type polio virus strains of each stereotype uh, that have been inactivated killed with formalin. So remember here the virus are inactivated or they are killed and it is an injectable vi- vaccine it's not an oral vaccine it can be administered alone or it can be administered in combination with other vaccines as well so ipv it provides serum immunity to all three types of polio virus there are three types of polio virus and ipv provides immunity to all the three types of polio virus and it results in protection against paralytic polio mellitus then studies have confirmed that two fractional doses one fractional dose is 1/5 of a full dose so we need two fractional dose of ipv given twice to infant first at the age of 6 weeks and then at the age of 14 weeks they provide the same protection against all the polio virus that is the all the three strains of polio virus as does one full dose of ipv so that's why in india these fractional doses of ipv has been introduced now let's discuss uh, what is the difference between ipv and opv now this is very important because uh, as i told you that there are two types of vaccine that protect against polio one is inactivated polio vaccine and the other one is oral polio vaccine right now ipv that is inactivated po- uh, injectable inactivated polio vaccine it contains live killed virus so remember here it is live killed virus that's why the name injectable inactivated polio vaccine right and opv it contains live weakened virus so it contains live virus it contains live killed virus now uh, that's why opv with opv there is a problem that it can lead to a risk of vaccine derived polio so vaccine can also lead to uh, this uh, problem of polio so from the vaccine uh, the polio uh, can be transmitted so that is known as vaccine derived polio and why it can be transmitted from opv because this contains live weakened virus it doesn't contain killed virus okay and that's why uh, this ipv is better than opv because it is made up of inactivated killed polio virus and it will provide immunity from all three strains of polio 
so that's what's the difference between ipv and opv and this is important now let's discuss other news related to vaccine uh, the, uh, there was this uh, this was a news that is hpv vaccine hpv is human papilloma virus so again it's a viral disease so it, uh, it it was debated that whether this hpv vaccine it should be included in the universal immunization program or not the universal immunization program already we have discussed in detail let's discuss this hpv vaccine and what is this problem of hpv so um, this vaccine it offers protection against sexually transmitted human papilloma virus so first of all this is a viral disease it is transmitted through virus second it is a sexually transmitted disease and um, uh, the vaccine averts the risk of contracting cervical cancer so uh, this uh, this hpv can lead to problem of cervical cancer also but the vaccine will avert the risk of this uh, uh, cervical cancer it needs to be administered before the first intercourse and who recommends two doses of the vaccines preferably in the 9 to 13 years of age so this is about human papillo uh, papilloma virus transmitted sexually and this vaccine will also avert the risk of cervical cancer okay now as i told you that measles rubella vaccine mr vaccine it, it it was recently introduced in uip that is universal immunization program so let's discuss about measles and then we'll discuss about rubella so measles first of all it's highly contagious so in diseases remember whether it's whether it's a viral disease bacterial disease whether it's an airborne or waterborne or it is contagious non contagious so these things you need to uh, focus on and uh, and apart from that you need to focus on the vaccine that is being provided in india so ma- measles is a highly contagious airborne disease that is transmitted orally through mu- mucus or saliva so through mucus and saliva uh, it can be transmitted orally it is an airborne disease and it's highly contagious it mainly affects children remember it mainly affects children and it can be spread rapidly through air due to sneezing or cough so you can see it's an airborne disease now uh, it was in news because who has officially declared brazil free of measles after no case of disease was registered in the year so one thing was that Brazil was declared free of measles so that's why it was in news apart from this uh, it was in news because of the measles rubella combined vaccine that will replace the measles monovalent vaccine in the UIP basket that is universal immunization program basket now union health minister has launched a single vaccine for dual protection against measles and rubella as a part of UIP that's what i have told you the campaign against these two diseases will start from five states like karnataka tamil nadu puducherry goa and lakshadweep these are those areas where this problem is more prominent uh, it covers it will be covering nearly 3.6 crore target children and following this uh, mr campaign measles rubella vaccine mr means that is measles rubella measles rubella vaccine will be introduced in routine immunization replacing the currently two doses of measles vaccine at 9 to 12 and 16 to 24 months of age now uh, as i have told you this measles is a contagious disease it's an airborne disease it can spread through coughing and uh, sneezing of infected person it mainly affects children and it can make a child vulnerable to other diseases also so that's why it's a it's a very uh, like uh, severe problem because it can lead to other life threatening complications such as pneumonia diarrhea and brain infection and just to give you a figure that globally in 2015 measles killed an estimated 134200 children and that too mostly under 5 years of age so they are more, more vulnerable and in india it killed an estimated 49200 children imagine in one year only measles has uh, killed uh, uh, so many children now what about rubella rubella is a mild infection as such it's a mild infection but it can have serious consequences if the infection occurs in pregnant women now if it if it occurs in in pregnant women then it causes crs that is congenital rubella syndrome now this is a public health concern why because crs that is congenital rubella syndrome it is characterized by congenital anomalies in the fetus and newborn affecting the eyes it may lead to glaucoma it may lead to cataract and ears it may lead to hearing loss so remember measles they affect mainly uh, children rubella although it's a mild infection but it can uh, have serious consequences if it occurs in pregnant women and why it can have serious consequences because it can cause crs which can uh, lead to congenital anomalies in fetus and newborn especially it affects the eyes as well as ears okay 
then this was a news that is made in india leprosy vaccine so this was a first of its kind leprosy vaccine that has been developed in india uh, it was to be launched uh, on a pilot basis in bihar and gujarat now what is this vaccine let's discuss this and then we'll discuss about leprosy so vaccine name is mycobacterium indicus prani and uh, that is mip it is developed by national institute of immunology this vaccine will be administered as a preventive measure to those staying in close contact with leprosy patient so this is uh, this will act as a preventive measure to whom to those who are staying in close contact with leprosy patient now what is leprosy first of all remember it's a bacterial disease it is caused by mycobacterium leprae and uh, it affects roughly around 1 lakh 27000 uh, uh, people in india every year so the figure is huge about 59% of world's leprosy patient live in india so so just imagine roughly around 60% of world's leprosy patient are living in india and that's why government has launched national leprosy eradication program in 1983 india achieved the goal of elimination of leprosy as a public health problem in december 2005 but still the problem persists because if you see chatisgarh dadra nagra haveli they have still not achieved elimination so still the problem is there and that's why this made in india leprosy vaccine has been introduced on a pilot basis in bihar and gujarat now let's discuss about india's national vaccine regulatory authority now uh, this was a news because who uh, who that is world health organization it has recently declared indian national regulatory authority functional and awarded it highest rating 4 that means 100% compliance with who benchmarks and good result with sustained improvement trend and stringent regulator of vaccine as per uh, the benchmarks set by developed countries and european union so this is a very good news that uh, indian national regulatory authority has been awarded highest rating for its compliance with the who benchmark now this national regulatory authority as specified by who these are national regulatory agencies that are responsible for ensuring international standards standards of quality and safety in vaccine production now that production can be for export or for domestically uh, for public distribution so these are those agencies that ensure that the quality and safety in in vaccine production uh, is up to uh, or is following the international standards it comprises of central drug standard control organization state drug regulatory authorities pharmaco vigilance program of india and adverse events following immunization structures at the central and state level so this is a very good news for india now uh, these two things were in news that is ebola and zika these two uh, diseases were in news in past 1 to 2 year so a new ebola vaccine see first of all remember both ebola and uh, zika they both are viral diseases so they both are uh, transmitted through virus this is ebola virus and uh, zika there is another zika virus now a new ebola vaccine has been proved to give 100% protection in its final test result and the trial uh, human trial was conducted in guinea guinea is a place in africa now this vaccine was called this was developed over a decade ago by public health agency of canada and us so the, the now the trials were successfully carried out in guinea the ebola trial of the vaccine was led by world health organization guinean health ministry and norwegian institute of public health so that's a good news that um, this vaccine has proved to give 100 percent protection in its final test result now ebola uh, this is uh, uh, the, the main symptoms of ebola virus are fever headache muscle ache and vomiting diarrhea and the feeling of nausea okay now let's discuss about zika virus so zika virus it's a vector borne disease it's a viral disease but it is spread through a vector so it's a vector borne disease that is transmitted primarily by aedes aegypti mosquito so this is a mosquito uh, this this uh, mosquito is it is it is transmitting this uh, zika virus so its name come from zika forest of uganda where the virus was first isolated in 1947 now the problem with this uh, this uh, transmission of zika virus is that this virus can cause fetal deformation you can see this can cause fetal deformation now what kind of fetal deformation this is known to cause microcephaly right now microcephaly as the name suggests micro and cephaly so that means in which infants they are born abnormally with smaller head so microcephaly means smaller head and uh, that's how it affects the or it deforms the fetal fetal fetus 
okay it is associated with uh, gbs that is gullian bear syndrome Th that's a condition in which the body's immune system it attacks nervous system so that's how this uh, uh, this um, zika virus is affecting the nervous system of fetus and it is related to dengue yellow fever japanese encephalitis and west nile virus how it is related first of all all these are viral disease second these are vector borne diseases okay now this can be transmitted sexually also so remember this can be a statement in prelims that is it can be transmitted sexually also who had declared a global health emergency in february 2016 and declared it over in november 2016 so that's why it was in news now brazilian scientists have identified another mosquito that is culix quinquu fasciatus mosquito that uh, that uh, this mosquito is another type of zika transmitting mosquito so that's why also it was is in, uh, it was in news so remember zika virus that's a vector borne disease that is transmitted by aedes aegypti mosquito now another mosquito has been found to be uh, to act as a zika transmitting mosquito and it leads to problem of microcephaly so abnormally small uh, brain okay or head now zika va vaccine that uh, this uh, that's a dna vaccine the first phase 1 of human trial uh, human cl uh, clinical trial of vaccine for zika virus is set to begin soon so now we are going for human uh, clinical trials of zika virus uh, uh, vaccine dna vaccine that's the name gls5700 so remember this name it has already been tested on animals and found to elicit robust antibody and t cell response so it is it has been proved to be successful on animals so now the human trial are conducted it It will be carried out on 40 healthy adults to evaluate safety, tolerability, and immunogenicity, and the interim results are expected before the end of year. So that's why it was in news. Remember this this uh, name that is this is the uh, the first uh, 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 Zika virus vaccine. right this we have already discussed that is transmitted by mosquito bite and uh, symptoms uh, uh, that is fever, rash, joint pain. red eyes no treatment or vaccine is available that's why we are going for vaccine illness is usually mild and death is rare but it leads to problem like microcephaly fetus deformation etc okay now there was another news like charge syndrome charge syndrome it's actually a genetic uh, disorder so it's a disorder that affects many areas of body charge if you see it stands for coloboma heart defect artesia cone also known as conal artesia now what does it mean see first of all you should understand that is a genetic disease a mutation in chd7 gene so a mutation in this gene is responsible for 60 to 70% of all charge defects so this mutation in the genes that is the chd7 gene will lead to this problem of charge many uh, individuals with charge syndrome they have a hole in one of the structures of the eye that is known as coloboma so you can see it here the c for charge the c in charge it stands for coloboma and what is coloboma that's a hole in the structure of eye which forms during early development so it affects the children some people also have small eyes like microphthalmia thalmia is related to Uh, 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 eyes and that's why small eyes that is microphthalmia one or both nasal passages may be narrowed or completely blocked it causes multiple life threatening disease because it affects the eyes it is affecting the nasal passage it is affecting the uh, structure of the eye as well so it can lead to deafness and blindness heart defects genital uh, problems and growth retardation and facial bone and nerve defects that cause breathing and swallowing difficulty because you see uh, one or both the nasal passage they may be narrowed or they can be completely blocked so it can lead to respiratory problems also so this is charge syndrome okay and says genetic disease now let's discuss about avian influenza that is h5n1 now remember there is h5n1 there is h7n9 there is h1n1 now generally students get confused in this so uh, remember uh, these thing that is h5n1 it is uh, related to avian influenza now why it was in news that is department of animal husbandry dairy and fisheries in the ministry of agriculture and Fa farmers welfare has declared india free from avian influenza that is h5n1 now this h5n1 first of all it's a type of influenza virus so remember it's a viral disease that causes a highly infectious severe respiratory disease in birds that's why it is called as avian influenza it, uh, the other name of this is bird flu although most influenza virus do not affect uh, humans h5n1 and h7n9 they have caused serious infection in humans so that's why it, it's a problem that h5n9 that is avian influenza and h7n uh, h5n1 and h7n9 they affect humans as well 
how does h5n1 influence spread to people uh, uh, influenza spread to pe people almost all cases of h5n1 infection in people have been associated with what it is associated with close contact with infected live or dead birds or h5n1 contaminated environment so we need to go for isolation uh, when this uh, h5n1 infection spreads so when people do become infected the mortality rate is about 60% there is no evidence although that the disease can be spread to people through proper prepared and thoroughly cooked food as such there is no evidence for that but according to who a few h5n1 uh, human cases have been linked to consumption of food made of raw contaminated poultry blood so as i've told you that mostly this infection in humans it is associated with close contact with infected live or dead birds so whenever this infection spread that is this uh, uh, human uh, sorry uh, avian influenza spread so there is culling of birds right so that there is no contact with the infected live or dead birds now uh, there is another thing that is h1n1 so h5 um, n1 this was avian influenza or bird flu h1n1 it is swine flu right now it's a res respiratory disease that is caused by virus so it's a influenza type virus that infect the res respiratory tracts of uh, pigs that's why the name swine flu people do not um, uh, normally get swine flu but human infections can and do happen so remember it's not that it cannot happen at all yes it can happen in 2009 a strain of swine flu called h1n1 infected many people around the world so we have the evidence also virus is contagious and it can spread from human to human so that's again uh, it's problematic symptoms of swine flu in people are similar to the symptoms of regular human flu it includes fever cough sore throat body ache headache chills and fatigue there is a vaccine available to protect against swine flu so remember what is swine flu how it can spread and this is h1n1 okay and this is a respiratory problem now this was a news that is scrub typhus uh, that is an acute illness it is caused by bacteria so remember it's a bacterial disease it is transmitted by the bite of an infected larva present in the soil having scrub vegetation so that's why the name scrub typhus first of all it is an it is a bacteria bacterial disease second it is transmitted by the bite of an infected larva which is present in the scrub vegetation so you can see the infected larva it can bite uh, the uh, the humans and this is how it can affect the um, humans now uh, himachal is an endemic region as it has large scrub vegetation so this is the area where this the, the where this problem is more prominent okay now let's discuss about uh, plasmodium falciparum sporozoites that is uh, pfspz it's an injectable vaccine that is developed by sanaria ing uh, now it is undergoing clinical trials and recently it got us uh, fda fast track designation to help to develop vaccines earlier for the patients now what is this uh, vaccine meant for it will halt transmission and eliminate plasmodium falciparum malaria so for this malaria plasmodium falciparum uh, falciparum malaria this particular vaccine is there and it would help in uh, providing protection against this kind of malaria to travelers and military person visiting the malaria endemic region so this is pf uh, spz vaccine for eliminating plasmodium falciparum malaria now there is cis wax vaccine it's a vaccine to fight tapeworm in pigs first uh, such vaccine in world to fight tapeworm in pigs it has been developed by india immunologicals inc a wholly owned subsidiary of national dairy development board this would help in improving the food safety of processed foods like pork that is uh, that is from pigs sometimes humans can get infected by ingesting the eggs of tapeworm in meats right so remember th this uh, uh, this vaccine is to fight tapeworm in pigs now let's discuss uh, chikungunya dengue so chikungunya is a mosquito borne disease mosquito borne that is vector borne disease and it's a viral disease this is very much prominent in india especially in post monsoon period in the northern india in uh, in delhi and in the surrounding areas chikungunya uh, virus uh, sorry chikungunya and dengue these are the uh, two main uh, viral disease that are uh, spreading especially in the post monsoon uh, period uh so when there is stagnant water so chikungunya is a mosquito born virus transmitted by aedes aegypti and aedes albopictus mosquito so these are the two mosquito that transmit uh this uh, vector born disease of chikungunya there is no specific antiviral drug treatment so there is no 
specific treatment antiviral treatment for chikungunya and there is no commercial vaccine as well that is the problem that there is no commercial chikungunya vaccine now its symptoms may range from abrupt fever severe joint pain now this is the problem in chikungunya there is severe joint pain often in hands and feet and may include headache muscle pain joint swelling or rashes this is also problem there is joint swelling rashes and there is severe joint pain there is no cure for the disease treatment is focused on relieving the symptoms that is a problem that as of now there is no commercial vaccine for chikungunya and there is no proper uh, antiviral drug treatment also so these are the symptoms headache fever vomiting feeling of nausea rash and then joint pain back pain so this is a problem in chikungunya now uh, with respect to dengue again dengue is also a viral disease dengue affects more than 390 people each year in 2016 more than 1 lakh confirmed case of dengue were reported in india and at times dengue can be fatal as well uh, researchers at calcutta university now they recently found that lutsia fuscana larva this larva demonstrated a preference for feeding on aedes aegypti so uh, what we are doing we are actually finding a predator for the uh, mosquito that causes dengue the mosquito is aedes aegypti now if we have a natural predator for this aedes aegypti then definitely we'll uh, we'll go for a natural way to uh, curb this uh, mosquito because this mosquito it spreads uh, uh, dengue so this lutsia fuscana remember this is a larva it's a natural predator of aedes aegypti and uh, the lutsia larva it being a potential biological control method it can be better solution than using dangerous chemicals to kill dengue mosquito so we are going for a biological control method in fact since 1928 india has already been using gambusia affinis these are the uh, mosquito fishes they they feed on these uh, mosquito so again it's a biological control role agent against mosquito larva it's an exotic species and has been disturbed uh, distributed throughout the warmer and some temperate parts of the world so this is also a natural predator this is also a natural predator right so remember these two natural predator and now we are going for biological control of these aedes aegypti mosquito now this was also news that is yours free status for india recently india received the official citation from who and unicef for being yours free india is the first country that's very remarkable that it is the first country to be officially acknowledged as being yours free india has achieved this important milestone of being yours free much before the who global target year of 2020 so that is very important that india has achieved this target much before the global target year uh, designated by who that is 2020 now it's a chronic infection remember it's a chronic infection that affects skin bone and cartilage it occurs mainly in poor communities in warm humid and tropical area this is very important you should understand what is this disease where it mainly spreads what are the climatic conditions that are conducive for the spread of disease okay so that is about yours now foot and mouth disease uh, this was in news because ministry of agriculture uh, it is allocated 100 uh, crore uh, rupees for fmd that is foot and mouth disease under rashtriya krishi vikas yojana so that's a flagship mission of india especially by ministry of agriculture in order to achieve the objective of foot and mouth disease mukt bharat so fmd free uh, india in next few years background that is foot and mouth disease it is one of the most economically devastating contagious viral animal disease so it's contagious disease it's a viral disease okay and it affects the animals it affects all susceptible cloven footed animals so it affects uh, various animals in india especially it is affecting the animal husbandry uh, that is uh, this uh, that are affected by this foot and mouth disease so it's a contagious viral disease in order to prevent uh, prevent this economic loss due to fmd disease a program na- named uh, foot and mouth disease control program it was uh, it's actually under implementation since the 10th plan period okay so currently we are under uh, this uh, 12th plan now uh, the, there was news related to super bugs so we'll discuss what are super bugs and what was the news okay so who has recently provided a list of 12 super bugs which pose an enormous threat to human health now who further urged medical experts and pharmaceutical researchers to focus first on fighting the most dangerous among these pathogens so uh, it has given a list of 12 superbugs and it is uh, urging the medical experts to fight the most dangerous among these pathogens so what are superbugs these are a strain of bacteria remember these are a strain of bacteria that has become resistant to antibiotic drugs after their prolonged exposure to antibiotics so this is actually a problem of antibiotic resistance and that is very prominent in india right uh, now um, 
so what are super bugs these are those strains of bacteria that become resistance to all the types of antibiotic drugs because they they already have prolonged exposure to antibiotics so they become resistant to those antibiotics hence the medicines they become ineffective and infections persist in the body increasing the risk of spreading to others over uh, what are the problems like uh, why this antibiotic resistant takes place one is overuse that is consuming more antibiotics than prescribed second misuse taking prescribed antibiotic incorrectly or taking antibiotic to treat viral infection so uh, overuse misuse of antibiotics that will generate uh, the condition of superbugs that is antibiotic resistance in the body so these are the main reasons for formation of superbugs human consumption of antibiotic treated chicken and livestock further increase resistance so we are giving antibiotics to chicken also and then we are consuming those chicken and livestock so that also increase antibiotic resistance so remember these causes this, these are very important from uh, from prelims aspect few important super works highlighted by who are mrsa uh, neisseria gonorrhea uh, this klebsiella e coli then uh, this bacteria has recently developed resistance to a powerful class of antibiotics called carbapenems okay you need not remember the name as such but the main ones that e coli you, you can remember now how antibiotic resistant uh, bacteria it spreads so if you see there is an infected person he goes to home he stays at home and spreads resistant bacteria to family and friends now he goes to healthcare fa uh, facility so he goes to hospital or other healthcare facility he will spread to other patients directly or through healthcare providers who don't wash their hands so healthcare facility could uh, then consider isolating such patients okay or uh, if he goes home again with antibiotic resistance so he will spread the bacteria to family and friend so this is how the antibiotic resistance it keeps on spreading okay and it leads to the problem of superbugs so how can we spread uh, how 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 can we stop the spread of superbugs now one is uh, reducing individual risk then maintaining good personal care and hygiene so that the, uh, so that it doesn't spread to other person then limit the antibiotics you receive that is overuse and misuse of antibiotics should be prevented use in uh, in of antibiotics in animals to is to be avoided worldwide about 80% of uh, all antibiotics are used in food animals but may but many a times antibiotics provide no or marginal benefit so the antibiotics that are used in uh, are, that are given to uh, animals that that may have marginal effect but that may cause antibiotic resistance so the use of antibiotics in animals should be avoided renew your focus on safe water uh, ndm ndm we'll discuss uh, it is found in new delhi's chlorinated water supply so it's a super bug and we need to focus on uh, safe water that is ndm free research and development can only be the long term solution for the problem so we need to go for r and d invest in r and d facilities and awareness among individuals so that is very important uh, regarding the spread of superbugs and international cooperation now related to this there is a red line campaign also red line campaign is also the aim is to uh, prevent the misuse or overuse of uh, uh, antibiotics now um, th th those uh, medicines that have a red line uh, uh on the, the those medicine that have a red line they have to be taken only on the prescription of doctor okay so uh, deadly superbug that is a new delhi metallo beta lactamase 1 uh, uh, this presence of this ndm1 gene in cholera and dysentery causing bacteria in the samples of delhi taps water led to increase in and uh, this uh, drug resistance in cholera and other diarrhea causing bacteria so what was the problem the, uh, there was a gene in these uh, bacteria which was uh, these bacteria which were causing cholera and dysentery the presence of this gene it was making that bacteria more resistant to drugs that were used for cholera and diarrhea treatment okay so how to stop superbug this we have already discussed reduce reliance on antibiotics use antibiotics the right way not to misuse or overuse don't skip on proper hygiene so that it doesn't spread to other uh, people like to wash your hands frequently so proper hygiene has to be maintained then avoid factory farmed meals so that's what we have discussed that it also gets transmitted through um, uh, meat or through animals so uh, one is not to use uh, or to avoid antibiotics in animals and if it is given then avoid the factory farmed meat okay 
then let's discuss about potassium bromate so this was a news because the government banned the use of potassium bromate as a food additive following a center for science and environment study that found its presence in bread it caused cancer so this is used in bread and it is uh, there was a study that said that it is it is causing cancer so as far as potassium iodate is concerned it has been referred to a scientific panel potassium iodate is also used as a food additive and it is too said to be carcinogenic but it has been as of now referred to a scientific panel so uh, the two, if you see these two food additives that is potassium iodate and potassium bromate they are banned in many countries because these are carcinogenic and these are listed as hazardous for public health according to cse that is center for science and environment potassium bromate typically increases the dough strength the dough which is used in bakery uh, it uh, uh, in uh, in that that uh, it increases the dough strength it leads to higher rising and gives uniform fish finish to baked products potassium iodate is a flow treatment agent so for these two for these purpose these two additives are used but it is it is said that it leads to uh, cancer so it's a carcinogenic agent okay now this was a news that is uh, multi toll indian institute of science that is iisc has developed a bone reconstruction method similar to joints of bone so remember this is very important this year uh, iisc indian institute of science it has developed a bone reconstruction method that is similar to joints of bone they have used multi uh, toll that is derived from maltose so that's why the name multi toll it's a sweetening agent that is found in most sugar free foods such as ice cream so uh, this will act as a bone reconstruction a uh, method that will be that is actually similar to joints of bone so what is this multi toll it is combined with other components to make long chain like structures that become plastic so these long chain like structure they act as a plastic and then it is used to fill in the bone gap caused by fracture instead of the traditional rod that is inserted so multi toll uh, would be a huge advantage over metal rods uh the uh, which do not allow growth of bone because these metal rods they inhibit the growth of bone especially in infants and adolescents and drugs can also be injected into it for faster healing so this is uh, this is going to be a game changer rather because it will help uh, the infants and adolescents it will help uh, in it also helps in allowing the growth of bone and uh, which was a problem in metal rod it will replace the metal rod and uh, this uh, multi toll remember it is uh, derived from maltose a sweetening agent that is found in most sugar free foods such as ice cream now there was another news that is jeevan rekha uh, so we have a e health project so recently kerala government remember it's not union government it's kerala government launched the world bank aided e health project called jeevan rekha so world bank aided e health project was launched by kerala government this is first of its kind initiative in the country it has two components one is public health component and the second is hospital automation module so you can uh, easily de decipher it from the uh, the word that is e health so there will be hospital automation module and the other component is public health component main aim is to integrate healthcare cloud that will contain all the health records of all its citizens in electronic form that is an e form public health component envisages the development of electronic health records of population while hospital automation module envisages the digitization of all government hospital so as we have discussed that there are two components Uh, public health comp component will uh, ensure the development of electronic health records of the population and the second that is hospital automation module it will envisage the digitization of all government hospital this system will automatically provide a unique identification number for any person who will have, who will have access uh, to the healthcare system and it also and also store his health record in electronic form so this is a very good uh, uh, concept that is e health project launched by kerala government and it is aided by world bank it has privacy clause also to ensure that the private health records they are not leaked in public domain and the uh, the privacy uh, of these uh, patients is maintained so this is the e health project provide treatment to people of state by electronic cards uh, there will be this health management information system mother and child tracking system uh, has been included it enabled integrated framework will be created to ensure effective healthcare to citizen now this was also news that now we have found a new organ itself that is mesentery the name of the organ is mesentery so a new human organ has been classified by ireland scientists known as mesentery it is a double fold uh, of peritoneum that is the lining of abdominal cavity that attaches our intestine this is the intestine to the wall of our abdomen and it keeps everything locked in the place so this new organ it is found in our digestive system this this is the mesentery 
right and earlier it was thought to be made up of fragmented separate structures so you can see earlier it was thought to be made up of uh, it was not thought as of uh, it's a whole organ in itself it was thought to be made up of fragmented uh, separate structures but recent research has shown that it's actually a one continuous organ it carries the blood and lymphatic fluid between the intestine and rest of body remember the function of the organ is very important so mesentery a new organ and the function is that it carries blood and lymphatic fluid between the intestine and rest of the body it also maintains the position of intestine so that it's connected with the abdominal wall without being in direct contact so these are the two main functions of mesentery that's a new organ in itself its reclassification as a new organ will help in better understanding about what kind of role does it play in abdominal and digestive diseases which could further lay, 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 uh, pave the way for less invasive surgeries fewer complications and faster patient recovery and eventually lower overall cost so this is very important this year that is new human organ the name is mesentery hyper uh, bilirubinema uh, this uh, the researchers from iit kharagpur they developed a technology that uses thumb print to detect this disease now this is a condition when there is too much bilu, uh, bilirubin in the blood and it turns the sclera of eye urine and even skin yellow so that's why that is the condition when there is too much bilirubin in the blood right and uh, the uh, researchers from iit kharagpur have developed a technology that uses thumb print to detect such condition so that's why the hyper the word hyper uh, that means that is there is too much bilirubin in blood it is commonly seen in people and newborn suffering with jaundice that's why uh, in jaundice you find that the eye the urine and skin uh, color it may become yellow when the bilirubin concentration in the blood typically exceeds 12 uh, exceeds 12 parts per million in adults and 50 ppm in a newborn researchers have used luminescence property of gold nano uh, clusters which are extremely sensitive to presence of molecules in the environment so <coughs> if you see excuse me uh, this uh, when a person has jaundice you, uh, with respect to hyper bilirubin anemia you you should remember one thing why it was in news that a uh, thumb print technology has been used to detect this condition what is this condition <coughs> excuse me it's a condition when there is too much of bilirubin in the blood and what it leads to it leads to yellowing of eye urine and skin when a person has jaundice uh you might have seen that it leads to yellowing of uh, eye uh, urine and skin and so when she presses the thumb on gold nano cluster coated membrane having copper deposited on its surface this bilirubin forms a complex with copper and restores the luminescence curtailed by copper so this is how they have uh, detected through this thumb print uh, technology and using uh, the this uh, gold nano clusters uh, it can be detect, de uh, detected that whether the person has this condition of hyper bilirubin anemia okay this is very important bgr34 because indigenously that is uh, csir has launched bgr uh, bgr34 it is india's first anti diabetic ayurvedic drug so first remember it is anti diabetic second remember it's ayurvedic drug its full form is blood glucose regulator so bgr34 where 34 represents the number of active phyto constituents from herbal resources uh, this uh, 34 are the active phyto constituents from herbal resources remember what's the number uh, what it uh, means this uh, this bja34 is designed for type 2 diabetes mellitus so there are two types type 1 and type 2 bja34 uh, is for mainly addressing the problem of type 2 diabetes bja34 has been jointly developed by national Bi uh, botanical research institute and central institute for medicinal and aromatic plants this is important who has developed it this is first anti diabetic ayurvedic drug the name blood glucose regulator 34 and what does 34 mean remember it's for type 2 diabetes it's not for type 1 this can be a statement in prelims modern diabetic uh, drugs cause side effects and toxicity while bgr34 works by controlling blood sugar and limiting the harmful effect of other drugs so this, this is an ayurvedic drug the harmful effects uh, that are faced in other drugs that are not present in this and uh, it's mainly it works by controlling the blood sugar so that's why blood glucose regulator 34 okay this is csir that is the council of scientific and industrial research now this was also news that is leucosin it is a drug launched by partnership of drdo and amil pharma uh, pharmaceuticals so that's a ppp that is public private partnership venture it is used for the safe treatment of leucoderma so that's a skin disease leucoderma and leucoskin is a drug that is launched to treat leucoderma okay 
it's an ointment plus it's an oral liquid uh, this was another disease that is uh, brucellosis uh, it's a zoonotic infection caused by bacterial genus brucella so remember it's a bacterial uh, disease this bacteria transmitted from animals to humans by ingestion uh, through injected food products direct contact with the infected animals or inhalation of aerosol this disease although it's not that new it's an old one and has been known by various names including mediterranean fever malta fever gastric remnant uh, remittent fever undulant uh, fever and humans are accidental host but brucellosis continues to be a major public health concern worldwide and it is most common zoonotic infection that is caused from animals so this is a bacterial disease and brucella organisms which are small aerobic intercellular cocobacilli localized in the reproductive organs of host animals and from the animals it will transmit to uh, humans they, uh, who are uh, either uh, in injecting the infected food products or their direct contact with the animals okay it causes abno uh, abortions and sterility so it it's a problem because it they localize in the reproductive organs of host animal and it can cause abortions and sterility so this is brucellosis it is name given to a bacterial infection which basically is contracted from animals usually due to a consumption of unpasteurized dairy products so you can see the main symptoms that is fever chills weakness lethargy muscle pain joint pain and headache okay and they are shed in large number in the animals urine milk placental fluid and other fluids so the through the uh, through the contact with contaminated animal these bacteria this bacterial infection can be transmitted to human of these the following four have moderate to significant human pathogenicity these are the four uh, brucellosis uh, uh, bacteria that is from sheep it can be transmitted from pigs from cattle and from dogs okay then this was a news that a kit for detection of chromium contamination uh, has been developed now uh, the main thing which you need to focus in this is what is the problem with chromium why we are uh, developing a kit for detection of chromium contamination and what is the problem that chromium leads to so chromium first of all where it is used this is this question can also be asked that chromium is found is is, re is released from which all industry so chromium is widely used in industries like leather steel chrome plating paint manufacturing wood preservation etc right so it is released from these industries so untreated influence from inf effluent from these industries they cause widespread contamination of water uh, as been reported in several parts of the country so it leads to chromium contamination now chromium in the environment it exists in two form one is chromium 3 that is trivalent chromium and the other one is chromium 6 that is hexavalent chromium now this is not a problem but the problem is this hexavalent chromium the latter that is chromium 6 it is toxic and the world health organization has classified it as carcinogenic it can cause cancer it can cause stomach ulcer it can cause cancers and severe damage to kidneys and liver so it's it's a, it's a bit problematic remember it's chromium 6 that is a problem chromium 3 is not a problem so as as per Indian standard uh, for drinking water, maximum permissible concentration of chromium-6 in drinking water is 50 microgram per liter. And US Environment Protection Agency, it recommends a still lower permissible concentration of 10 micrograms per liter. Detection of chromium-6 at such low level is not only technically challenging, but also expensive and time consuming. So that's why we have developed a kit for detection of chromium contamination and why we want to uh, detect it because it is carcinogenic it is released from all these industries and it can contaminate the water that water can be consumed by humans and it can lead to cancer stomach ulcers and kidneys and uh, affect the kidney and liver so this kit has been developed by baba atomic research center it has developed a simple user friendly quick and cost effective kit for on site determination of chromium right it provides a much needed solution to measure the level of chromium because uh, 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 this this uh, the permissible concentration this uh, that is very low 50 microgram per liter in india and us environment protection agency it recommends 10 microgram per liter so it's not technical it's actually technically challenging to measure chromium at such low level so uh, now this bark has developed a low cost kit that can detect uh, chromium 6 at such low level right it can detect chromium contamination in drinking water in tap water in lakes river as well as in groundwater the procedure involves adding a specified am amount of specific regions to the water sample and identifying the developed color so the color develops within five minutes and the distinction can be made with the naked eye so it's very uh, simple as such that there is a change in color if there is contamination with chromium and uh, 
for ease of comparison a color chart is provided with the kit water samples can be immediately categorized as being safe or toxic for drinking chrome uh, from chromium 6 point of view so kit it provides several uh, advantages like real time detection on site detection and instantaneous result because the color can change within 5 minutes elimination of use of sophisticated instruments very easy to handle low investment on infrastructure for production of kit and easy availability of raw materials and a very good accuracy for the uh, intended purpose okay now this was the news that is e-cigarettes now what are e-cigarettes see e-cigarettes that is electronic uh, cigarettes electronic nicotine delivery systems these are the most common prototype of which are e-cigarettes the new age formula for people trying to quit smoking so those who want to quit smoking but they have this habit of smoking they can try e-cigarettes however uh, they present a simultaneous promise and threat in the world of tobacco control so there are some side effects of this e-cigarette it looks like this this is cartridge this is atomizer and this is the battery right and here we have the led light so they are projected as tobacco association products by various sellers including tobacco giants themselves the lack of concrete evidence and support of this claim plus there is absence of any regulatory approval for their use make them a serious public health threat so all those who want to uh, end uh, smoking or st quit smoking they can go for this but uh, it has uh, there are uh, still no concrete evidence that how it affects the public uh, health so it is said that uh, it, it it can be harmful for public health as well so as uh, e cigarettes contain nicotine and not tobacco they do not fall within the ambit of cigarettes and other tobacco products uh, that is the uh, this uh, law that is prohibition of advertisement and regulation of trade and commerce production supply and distribution act 2003 which mandates stringent health warnings on the packaging and advertisement of tobacco product. The current unregulated sale, this is a problem uh, that is not uh, regulated. The unregulated sale of e-cigarette is dangerous for a country like India where the number of smokers is on the decline and they can go for e-cigarette. So it increases the possibility of e-cigarettes becoming a gateway for smoking by inducing nicotine. Now that can be harmful and it can uh, lead to nicotine addition, addiction and perpetuating smoking by making it more attractive. So it can be all the more harmful, right? India becomes a member of International Vaccine Institute. That's another good news. Recently, Union Cabinet, Cabinet has given its approval uh, for the proposal of India taking full membership of International Vaccine Institute Governing Council. So this move involves payment of annual contribution of US dollar 5 lakh to International Vaccine Institute. This is in Seoul, South Korea. This is important for prelims. This uh, institute, uh, it was established in 1997 on the initiatives of UN Development Programme. Uh, it is an international organization devoted to developing and introducing new and improved vaccines to protect the people, especially children, against deadly infectious disease. So it's a good move that India has now become a full member of this vaccine, International Vaccine Institute that is in Seoul in South Korea. This was also in news that is capping of stents. So National Pharmaceutical Pricing Authority capped the price of stents. So this was in news. What is a stent first of all? Now stent if you see that's a metal or plastic tube. You can see it here. It can be a metal or plastic tube. It is inserted into the lumen of anatomic, anatomic vessel or duct to keep the passageway open. So this is mainly given uh, or administered in those uh, uh, patients which are suffering from uh, this heart disease. So it is used to widen or open arteries which carry blood from heart to body so it is the main purpose is to widen is to widen these uh, uh, arteries because this this is the cholesterol that is deposited here so that can lead to heart attack so in order to widen this uh, artery uh, uh, this uh, stent is placed and it is used to widen or open arteries which carry blood from heart to body there are various types of stents uh, stentograft stentograft it, it is a stent coated with fabric drug diluting strength it is used to dilute drug with blood biodegradable strength it is made up of material that may dissolve or be absorbed in the body so there are various types of strength here you should focus on what is a strength it is used to open arteries and what are arteries they are they carry blood from the heart to the body okay so this was all about uh, health now we'll discuss about biotechnology so if you see uh, one in biotechnology what was the news let's discuss it, uh, it uh, 
first is human genome project human genome what is human genome it refers to the entire genetic makeup of human beings it's an international effort to identify and locate all the genes and their variants understand their functioning and write down the sequence of nucleotide that comprise the gene this is a very uh, important project uh, that will actually uh, tra tra track all the entire genetic makeup of human beings uh, then uh, the project it began in 1990 and it it was completed in 2003 scientists were from us uk france germany japan and china objectives to identify all the approximately 30000 genes in human dna to determine the sequence of 3 billion chemical base pairs that make up human dna to store this information in database that's very important to improve tools for better data analysis to address the ethical legal and social issues that may arise from human genome project because we are actually tracking all the 30000 genes we are uh, storing this whole uh, database and uh, what can be the issues like genomic data that that was uh, that will be stored as such it can be misused patients taking test face significant risk of jeopardizing or affecting it may, it may have adverse effect on their employment or insurance status because if they face any genetic problem and if it is leaked then it may affect the employment or insurance status so this, this these are the uh, ethical legal and some social issues are also there in human genome project now why this was in news See on June two two thousand sixteen, scientists from multiple academic institutions institutions in U.S. they published a perspective in general sci uh, journal Science, proposing a second human genome project that is that will be called as Human Genome Project Right. The first human human genome project that we just now discussed, the original one was referred to as Human Genome Project Read. So here, the first one that is HGP Human Genome Project Read, it aimed to read a human genome. right uh, now many scientists believe that to truly understand a genetic uh, blueprint it is necessary to write dna and build human genomes from scratch so in the second one that, that is this one we'll write the dna and we'll build uh, human genomes from uh, scratch so it will be an open academic international scientific research project led by a multidisciplinary group of scient uh, scientific leaders uh, from various uh, countries who will oversee a reduction in the cost of engineering and testing large genomes including human genome so this will be developed they will be developing new technologies and an ethical framework for genome scale engineering as well as transformative medical application overall goal what is overall go goal uh, is to further our understanding of blueprint of our life that is dna or the genes as such so uh, to understand the blueprint for life provided by a human genome project read so in this right we'll write the dna and we'll build human genomes from scratch how it will benefit humanity uh, uh, potential applications can be grow, growing transplantable human organs thus it will save lives of thousands engineering immunity to virus and cell lines engineering cancer resistance into therapeutic cell lines enabling high productivity cost efficient vaccine and pharmaceutical development using human cells and organoids how will hgb right benefit biomedical research so one is how it will benefit humanity then how it will benefit the biomedical research so similar to sequencing and computation dna synthesis is a foundational technology hgp right is therefore expected to accelerate research and development across the spectrum of life sciences it will support basic research and development of a new based therapies new vaccines material energy resources and food okay now new computation tools will be developed phenotyping screening platforms such as uh, organ cultures which allow characterization of performance of synthetic dna and variants variants of unknown significance so it will be cheaper more accurate and longer dna synthesis and assembly will be possible then okay targeted delivery to specific cell types or systematically uh, throughout multiple organ systems can be uh, then uh, be possible after this Uh, hgp right so it has uh, enormous benefit for bena uh, be uh, for humanity and for biomedical research now this was a news that is three parent baby now the three parent baby uh, it is related to a mitochondrial disease see scientists have developed a new technique for preventing mitochondrial disease by creating a three parent baby that is a child in which the vast majority of dna comes from mother and father and a small amount will come uh, out of a dna a small amount of dna that is small amount of uh, this dna will come from a female donor so there are three parent as such one will be the biological mother biological father and the third will be a female donor right now this is mainly uh, done when there is mitochondrial disease in the mother so mitochondria what are mitochondria these are the 
organelles that are inside the cell that mainly generate energy so these are the energy building organelles in the um, cell and organelles they are passed from mother to child so if there are problem in the mother mitochondria then only this three parent baby concept is applied so mutations in the 37 genes housed inside mitochondria can lead to fatal inherited disease that will affect the organs and uh, that needs lot of energy such as brain and muscle so brain development muscle development can be affected if that mitochondrial uh, disease is inherited by the child from the mother so there is no cure or effective treatment for many of the mitochondrial disease so that's why this uh, three parent baby concept has emerged now what is this three parent baby concept now see this is the biological mother, this is the biological father. So mother's egg cell and father's sperm, right? So mother's egg with uh, with faulty mitochondrial. You can see the faulty mitochondrial uh, DNA. So mother's uh, egg cell, this is the egg cell and the, the uh, father's uh, uh, sperm plus the mother has this faulty mitochondrial DNA. Now this... Uh, uh, this will be taken out that the parent's gene will be taken out and it will be put. This parent's gene will be trans uh, planted into donor egg. This will be the donor egg with healthy mitochondrial. So you can see this, the, the mother egg has not been used as such. Uh, if you see, because mother has the fa faulty mitochondrial DNA. So the genes of the parents, both mother and father, will be transplanted into a donor egg. Donor egg means that is a female that will donate uh, her egg. Uh, and the female will have healthy mitochondria. Okay, so this faulty mitochondria uh, DNA is done away with and the parent genes are inserted. So as such the uh, baby will, will carry the genes of the biological parents only, right? So the reconstructed embryo then implanted back into the mother. So once uh, after fertilization, the embryo will develop and... Uh, that embryo will be implanted back into the biological mother right so this one is the biological mother and resulting baby has three genetic parents that is biological mother biological father and the donor mother okay some of the mitochondria in the baby's boy mother cell have a mutation that causes lay syndrome a fatal neurological disorder that's why we don't want those faulty mitochondria to be tra uh, transmitted to the uh, child so most of her mitochondria function properly so she doesn't have the syndrome but she can pass the disease on to her child so that's why this disease is passed on from the mother to the child it takes three people to make these fertilized eggs uh, that we have discussed how three parent baby is uh, this concept is there Mitochondrial DNA doesn't contribute to a person's trait. So, a mitochondrial uh, donor hardly constitute a parent. So, see, as such, if you see, the genes are of the biological mother and biological father only. Th this uh, female donor, uh, she's only donating the egg. So, as such, the genes of that uh, that mother, uh, the female, they are, not, uh, uh, they are not as such transmitting. So, that's why we say, some uh, scholars say that the three-parent baby is actually a misnomer. But you should understand for prelims you should understand this concept of three parent baby uh, when it uh, when this uh, this three parent baby concept is applied when there is a faulty mitochondrial dna in the mother now there was this news related to gm mustard uh, technical subcommittee of india's genetic engineering regulator has concluded that the genetically modified variety that is dmh dhara mustard hybrid 11 do not raise any public health or safety concerns for human beings or animal now the, regarding this uh, a report was released by the regulator what is who is the regulator that is the genetic engineering appraisal committee which sought suggestions from the public over the next 30 uh, days after uh, the regulator concluded that this dmh 11 variety is it's not uh, it will not pose any public health or safety concern so the introduced protein in this uh, this uh, genetically modified uh, mustard that is barnes and barster remember these are the two proteins that are expressed at negligible to non detectable levels in the edible part and have been derived from commonly occurring non pathogenic bacteria so they have been uh, derived from this bacteria the proteins are barnes and barster okay Barnes and Barster genes they are used for engineering male sterility in plants so the main purpose of this, these proteins are uh, for engineering male sterility in plants uh, suggestions from the public will have to be then evaluated by genetic engineering appraisal committee to see if the evidence on biosafety has been ignored or not or whether the evidence on biosafety has been followed properly if there are no such concern then this organization or the regulator will have to decide whether to recommend this mustard 
GM Master for uh, for commercial cultivation. This GEC recommendation will then be approved by the eventually by Environment Minister, whose decision will be final. Now, similar to GM Mustard, we have GM Alternative to Monsanto. So, Indian scientists have developed two new sets of indigenous transgenic events in cotton cultivation. That is a potential alternative to Monsanto seeds. So, Monsanto is mainly providing the uh, these GM crops. So, now we have indigenously developed transgenic events in cotton cultivation. So, we are using this GM cotton. Uh, scientists at Delhi University Center for Genetic Manipulation of Crop Plants have developed two independent events for insertion of Cry1AC gene. This is the gene, right? This gene is isolated from a soil bacterium that is Bacillus thuringiensis, that is Bt. That's why we call it Bt cotton. It is toxic for American bollworm insects. So this is the gene that is isolated from this bacterium. Remember, the gene is this. This is the bacteria, and this from this bacteria, this gene has been isolated, and this uh, gene is toxic for the pest that is American bollworm insect. The other promising ind ind indigenous GM event is a white fly resistant cotton. So uh, GM crop that GM cotton that will be resistant to white fly. White fly is a problem uh, uh, in India with respect to cotton. It was developed by National Botanical Research Institute. Now, scientists have isolated and cloned a gene from an edible fern. This is the edible fern from which a gene has been isolated. So, the gene TMA12, it encodes a protein that is toxic to whitefly. In this, we have discussed that is Cryo-AC gene that was from bacterium Bt and it was toxic to, to American bollworm. In this, the gene is this. It, uh, it is uh, taken up from an edible firm and it is, uh, this gene is toxic to whitefly. So, that's why whitefly resistant cotton. Now, alternative to Bt cotton, Union government is working to develop a suit of Bt cotton genes that can be integrated into traditional variety and it will be made available to farmers. So, there will be a viable alternative. So, that's what we have discussed. That is white fly resistant cotton and uh, this, uh, this Cryo-AC gene. So, uh, indigenously, we are actually developing these uh, GM uh, cotton. So, we need not rely on Monsanto seeds. So, this would be a viable alternative to current Bt cotton technology, which is largely sourced from foreign uh, company Myoko Monsanto Biotech India Limited. So that's why uh, th this is a problem because we need to import and all the farmers they need to rely on them. Uh, now if we have uh, indigenously developed this then we need not rely on foreign sources. So it would be a joint collaboration of CSIR that is Council of Scientific and Industrial Research and DBT that is Department of Biotechnology. BT cotton that is a GM crop. It is a genetically modified variety of cotton that contain contains those genes that is insecticidal gene that will kill or that will be toxic to insects. It it is sourced from soil bacterium and the bacteria is Pt that is Bacillus thuringiensis. It is targeted at key cotton pest that is American bollworm. It is the only GM crop that is legally allowed in India at present. GM food crops such as brinjal and mustard which are in advanced stages of regulatory clearance. This we have discussed that how this mustard is in advanced stage of regulatory clearance. They are yet to become available to farmers due to stringent opposition by anti-GM activist group. So let's discuss broadly that what are the problems uh, with respect to GM crops and what are the advantages of it and whether we should go for it or not like we already have uh, bt cotton that's a gm crop whether we should also go for for other uh, gm crops which are edible crops okay so the advantages can be agriculture process can become eco-friendly because there will be less use of pesticides fertilizer and water gene technology can be one of the solution of world hunger because it can increase the production and lower the cost of food gene modification can boost immunity and it can develop inbuilt vaccine for livestock and human body so it will develop immunity and uh, crops can be grown in areas suffering from drought because we can have uh, GM uh, crops that is genetically modified crops that are drought uh, tolerant or salt tolerant or drought resistant. Okay, many people rely on GM food for medicine, example insulin for diabetes. It allows a much wider selection of traits for improvement and GM food can fortify micronutrients. So through uh, GM we can also fortify uh, these micronutrients. This we have discussed that is bacillus thuringiensis. This we have already discussed about the whole issue related to uh, the Bt cotton that is the only uh, uh, GM crop that is allowed in India, right? So this we have already discussed uh, that is Bt that is bac bacterium bacillus thuringiensis from which the gene is taken and which that gene is toxic to the insect, especially the American bollworm, okay?
now uh, since we have discussed the uh, gm crops advantages let's discuss uh, very quickly the gm crops disadvantages as well so gm crops it it will contaminate non uh, it will contaminate non gm crops because coexistence is not possible okay pollen can travel long distances by way of by wind and insects and human error and curiosity or simply regular farming practices also help seed to spread so it can contaminate non gm or indigenous crops also it would endanger the indigenous seed that these farmers have developed over centuries and that they trust and know so gm crops will foster dependence on a corporate seed supply we have discussed this just now that we are now dependent on monsanto for the seed supply so uh, this uh, actually leads to dependence on corporate seed supply more than 80% of small scale farmers in india today they save their on farm produced seeds for the next season so they are uh, they are uh, saving their the seeds that are produced on the farm for the next season but farmers sometimes do this because they do not have enough money to buy new seeds and sometimes because they value their own seed but if there will be gm seed these are uh, there is terminate a seed concept that these seeds can uh, the the crop it can grow once only it cannot be uh, it cannot generate uh, uh, seeds that that can turn into a crop uh, that can uh, that can be cultivated okay so there is a concept of terminator seed also so uh, this is the main problem in fact uh, this will affect the small farmers that depend on their on farm seeds gm crops can contaminate non gm uh, crops uh, it will it actually leads to dependence on the foreign companies like monsanto right also seed sharing it's a cultural norm in many indian communities the introduction of gm seeds may jeopardize these traditional and vital practices this is what i was telling you that gm crops this is one of the main problem it ushers in a terminator and traitor technology terminator and traitor technology let's discuss what is terminator seed and what is traitor technology so a terminator seeds these are genetically modified seeds so that plants that they grow into produce sterile seeds the seeds such sterile seeds they cannot uh, seeds that are infertile they cannot germinate in the next season or at any other time so we can use them only once okay so these are the terminator seeds now traitor technology it produces gm crops that need to be sprayed with certain chemicals in order to grow properly so then the farmers also need to buy these chemicals right so it will be another burden for the farmers so traitor technologies can allow traits in genetically modified seeds why we need traitor uh, why what is the use of traitor technology uh, uh, this traitor technology it produces those uh, gm crops that uh, that is needed to be sprayed with certain chemicals one thing second it allows traits in genetically modified seeds to be switched on and off by using special chemicals so this is the problem that uh, the farmers have to buy these chemicals also because these gm crops won't work without those chemicals second the, the problem is the terminator seed because the crop will actually produce sterile seed so that cannot be used in the next season these traits usually involved are those that allow gm seeds to develop into better crops so these are this is the uh, traitor technology without these uh, traits the gm crop may either not grow or develop special traits that make them different from organic variety so that's why it is mandatory that uh, these uh, these are uh, gm crops uh, they are sprayed with the certain special chemicals okay Uh, then another problem is that gm crops are patented transnational corporations own nearly 100% of agriculture biotechnology patents right and the majority of these patents are controlled by a handful of pesticide corporation these company then they will use their patents to block the research that doesn't suit their interest so then there is this problem of vested interest uh, they can trap farmers into paying them royalties every year on seeds and into a never ending dependence on their chemical inputs because they have the traitor technology gm crops they favor industrial agriculture system they are designed for agriculture system that are characterized by large farm but in india if you see more than 80% of the farmers they have less than 2 hectare uh, of uh, this land right so in india large farm concept is not that prominent monocropping it will it will uh, affect uh, this uh, biodiversity because it leads to monocropping it needs mechanization right but since we have very less land with the farmer so mechanization is also not that possible and reliance on external input so these are the problems because indian agriculture system is not like this okay so uh, the uh, gm crops will need more of investment gm crops it is said that it will not reduce hunger in india because hunger in india is not due to lack of food there is enough food for all as per some scholars but the main problem is the poor purchasing power of population because of poverty plus the problem is improper distribution of foods 
right and uh, there are not significant evidence that claim that yes gm crops are totally safe for human health so uh, it is said that gm crops may pose also a threat to human health so we have discussed all the advantages and disadvantages of ge genetically modified crops now what can be done what can be the way forward that is there should be fair trade and improved food processing and marketing system that will improve the food productivity right and uh, uh, plus it will also lead to improved food processing okay improved rural infrastructure farmer friendly and uh, farmer friendly credit schemes uh, that is loan uh, schemes uh, to farmer uh, low irrigation low cost irrigation system uh, then rural training to sharpen the skills of local farmers in food production and food processing so these are some of the alternatives which we need to do uh, like uh, if there are some uh, disadvantages of gm crops although there are some advantages also but uh, simultaneously we need to uh, make our rural agriculture system uh, bit more robust by improving rural infrastructure by providing better credit schemes by ensuring low cost irrigation system and by improving the skills of farmers now this was also news that is first human uh, genetic editing trial so chinese scientists they are set to perform the world's first genetic editing trial on uh, trial on humans in uh, they, they it was in news in 2016 in order to cure for lung cancer so uh, they will inject they they had injected this patients with cell that have been modified using a specific gene editing technique now what is this technique so the process of genetic editing will be carried out through crisp uh, per cas9 technique this is important this is a gene editing technique this the full form of crispr is clustered regular regularly interspace short palindromic repeats now what is this this is a collection of dna sequences that led the scientists to selectively edit uh, some genome parts and replace them with new dna stretches and this CS CS9 it is an enzyme that can edit DNA allowing the alteration of genetic patterns through genome modification so remember this is a collection of DNA sequence and CS CS9 it's an enzyme that can edit DNA right so uh, CRISPR it directs this enzyme CS CS9 uh, where to cut and where to paste so this is the first human genetic editing trial and doctors uh, will extract first the t cell that's a type of immune cell from the lung cancer patient and then they will edit them the edited cell will then be multiplied multiplied artificially in the laboratory and then they will be reintroduced into the patient's body and t cells are, are then expected to attack tumor cells so that is we are curing for lung cancer this technique has been approved in uk already as a way to bypass a baby inheriting harmful mitochondrial disease so this is a very important technique that is human genetic editing uh, trial remember these two terms that is crispr this is a collection of dna sequence that will allow the scientists to uh, selectively edit the genome parts and this is an enzyme that can edit dna okay now there is another news that is biotech uh, kisan and cattle genomics so ministry of science and technology it has launched two farmer centric initiatives known as biotech kisan and cattle genomics so if you see the full form is krisha uh, of kisan is krishi innovation science application network so uh, this uh, initiative of ministry of science and technology first of all remember this is an initiative of science and technology ministry okay so what's the benefit for farmers this is a farmer centric scheme launched by the department of biotechnology where scientists will work in sync with farmers to understand the problems and fa find solution by farmers that is developed in consultation with farmers as we have seen that it will be in sync with farmers uh, this uh, particular biotech kisan it aims to link, link farmers scientists and science institutions in order to better understand the problem of farmers okay it will empower the uh, women because the scheme includes mahila biotech kisan fellowships fellowships for training and education in farm practices for women farmers and it also aims to support the women farmers entrepreneur entrepreneurs in their small enterprise making her a grassroots and in, uh, innovator so it's it will also empower women it will connect globally because it will connect farmers to global best practices it will provide them training and they will be training workshop will, which will be held in india as well as in other countries then there will be a hub and spoke model in each of these 15 regions a farmer organization will act as a hub it will be connected to different science lab uh, and krishi vigyan k in the state agriculture university that are located in that region so that hub that is the farmer organization will reach out to the farmers in the region and it will connect them to scientists and institutions so that's a very good endeavor uh, to address the problem of farmer and by their uh, participation okay cattle genomics this is another scheme that is through this program the government aims to improve the genetic health of cattle population through genomic selection 
so we need high uh, we need to ensure <coughs> excuse me we need to ensure high yielding disease resistant and resilient livestock so in that uh, we are mainly trying to improve the genetic health of cattle population genome sequencing of indigenous cattle breeds from all the registered cattle breeds of india by involving various stakeholders so we will go for genome sequencing of indigenous cattle breed and this uh, program it envisages development of high density dna chips this will reduce the cost and time interval for future breeding program so in short uh, the main aim aim is to improve the genetic health of cattle now for that we'll go for genome sequencing we, this will also envisage development of high density dna chips now that dna chips will reduce the cost and time interval for future breeding programs and productivity of indigenous cattle that will be enhanced okay now this was also in news that is dna tagging of con uh, convicts why it was in news because andhra pradesh is now dr uh, drafting a leg legislation that will enable collection and storage of genetic fingerprints in a centralized database to track offenders so what is dna fring fingerprinting first of all it's a laboratory technique used to establish a link between the biological evidence and a suspect in criminal investigation so dna fingerprint fingerprinting can be used for criminal investigation it is used to establish paternity now this can be a question like what for what purpose dna fingerprinting can be used it can be used for criminal investigation for establishing paternity seed stock identification and the authenticity of consumer products and medical diagnosis diagnosis okay now uh, if you see the chemical structure of everyone's dna is same but the only difference between people or an animal is the order of these base pair so that is what is used in this concept is used in this dna uh, fingerprinting but it is said that twins may have the same dna but every person could be identified by the sequence of their base pair so as such the chemical structure is same but the difference is in the order of these base pair so that will be difference in every individual and that's why this dna fingerprinting concept is being used okay so it's a technology of identifying individuals from certain sequences in their dna that don't code for any protein which are termed as variable number tandem repeats now uh, in place of this variable uh, number tandem repeats str that is small tandem repeats is also used as such and uh, this is the uh, agrose gel that is being used so this is the dna fingerprinting concept which uh, the main thing which you need to understand is what is the main purpose for which this dna fingerprinting concept can be used okay and the uh, the the concept behind this dna fingerprinting is that every individual has the different order of base pair so the sequencing of base pair is different now another news was agricultural biotechnology rice variant so uh, assam agriculture university has developed two rice variants ranjit sub 1 and bahadur sub 1 it's an extension of ranjit and bahadur varieties being used by farmers currently in uh, assam so remember these name these are actually the varieties of rice so the objective is to get better yield under submerged conditions in assam mainly in barak valley so barak is a river and state is prone to periodic flash floods so uh, the main purpose is to get better yields even in the submerged condition because this assam is frequently uh, facing the problem and uh, there is a, the, uh, the problem of floods there are annual floods in uh, in assam right so it's mainly uh, this uh, this particular rice varieties for the barak valley okay now gelator it's a compound developed by research at indian institute of science education and research in tiruvananthapuram in kerala it is a compound to recover marine oil spill so remember this can be a uh, possible question that is gelator it's a compound that will be used to recover marine oil spill with a simple efficient and cost effective method this marine oil spill is a problem right it is partly hydrophobic and partly hydrophilic hydrophobic means water loving hydrophilic means uh, water repelling so hydrophilic part forms gelator fiber the hydrophobic part is responsible for diffusion into the oil layer this uh, gelator congeals oil that is making oil semi solid uh, from an oil water mixture so it will make the oil semi solid and then the oil can be separated easily from water so unlike other alternatives the gelator are in a powder form and can be easily applied over the oil water mixture that is the oil spill thus avoiding any environmental damage so it uh, it avoid any uh, side effect it can be reused several times so remember this gelator that's a compound that will be used for recovering marine oil spill 
then the last news that is RIDL technology release of insects carrying dominant lethal genes technology it's a technology using genetically modified mosquitoes to suppress wild female Aedes aegypti, Aedes aegypti mosquito population that transmit dengue it transmit chikungunya and it transmit zika virus so we, this we have already discussed that dengue chikungunya and zika virus these are vector borne diseases they are transmitted through female Aedes aegypti mosquito now through biotechnology we are trying to use a technology that will use uh, genetically modified mosquito now that will suppress the wild female mosquitoes so it uses a genetically modified male Aedes aegypti mosquito right uh, carrying a dominant lethal genes le lethal genes so wild mosquito that is female mosquito they mate once in their lifetime single female can lay hundreds of eggs in a lifespan right this is a normal course in RIDL concept a female mosquito mate with the RIDL male, males that is the genetically modified mosquito so when this male GM mosquito it will mate with the wild female mosquito you can see what will happen the lethal gene is passed on to the offspring that kills the larva before they reach adulthood so this is another method like uh, earlier we had discussed that there is a concept of biological control we are using predators this this concept uh, is another method that is through biotechnology we will induce genetically modified male uh, mosquito that will mate with the uh, wild uh, uh, mosquito and then the genes are such that uh, such genes are inserted that are lethal so lethal gene will be passed on to the offspring and that will kill the larva before they reach adulthood Sing since male mosquitoes do not bite humans the release of gm males does not increase the risk of dengue chikungunya and zika so this was also a concern that how these uh, uh, genetically modified uh, mosquito they can whether they can affect human beings or not but since the male mosquito are not biting human being it, it it's a female mosquito that is biting so the release of gm males does not increase the risk of dengue chikungunya and zika so this is all about biotechnology and health issues. I hope this will be uh, highly beneficial for all the UPSC aspirants. Thank you.